Hi everyone, welcome to this year's Oxwash London Climate Action Week workshop. We are joined today by three awesome individuals from all sorts of different investing theses and structures. We have Emma joining us from Ascension Ventures, one of the UK's leading venture firms for investing in impact and sustainable investments, especially in Europe. We're joined by Duncan, who is the founder of Climate, which is a phenomenal new app that you should, and a platform that you should download immediately to start putting your money to good use, investing in sustainable and responsible funds. And Luke, who is the CMO and co-founder of Crowdcube, which many of us will have heard of, is certainly one of the most prestigious platforms for crowdfunding in the UK and has some awesome impact driven companies currently listed on the platform and big names that have done it in the past as well. So let's kick things off. So um, team, just to do a quick round of introductions, um, I think hopefully you all know who I am, otherwise this could be a bit of a slippery slope of a meeting, but Emma's joining us from Ascension Ventures. Um, Emma, I don't know if you want to just give us a quick little who you are. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Um, so um, Emma, I, I joined Ascension three and a half years ago now to manage uh, an impact fund there called Fair by Design. And it was all about um, tackling the poverty premium in the UK. So Ascension sort of actually has, has built a reputation as a sort of pre-seed and seed investor for the past sort of five, six years, um, but more and more as part of their, their core um, tax efficient funds, they've been doing tech for good investing for a while and then little by little kind of making it part of their their thesis um so now we do impact across quite a, a few funds actually um so fair by designing what is one we've got a a fund that tackles food inequalities and also a, a fund in partnership with the conduit uh, that is looking at various different sort of sdg um driven themes um of which one is uh is uh when we invested in you, Kyle, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> exactly. Very, very happy for us to be working together on that, which was an awesome process. Thanks, Emma. Um, then we've got Duncan from Climate. I don't know, Duncan, if you could give us a quick little intro on who you are and what's happening at Climate. It's super exciting. Yeah, sure. So, so Climate, Climate Invest, is a, it's a fintech. It's a fintech that empowers anyone to invest into companies making a difference on on climate change and sustainability. Um, we're actually raising on Crowdcube right now. So big fan of, of Luke and, and his work, his platform. Um, and my background, I've spent most of the last 20 years in sustainability. So I've built several clean tech businesses. And then I sort of moved back to what I was doing before that, which is sort of the, the investing side in the last five or six years and back quite a few energy tech type businesses, startups, and now with Climate. So uh, yeah, looking forward to the, to the debate. Awesome, thanks Duncan. And then last but certainly not least, Luke, perhaps you could give us your bio. Hi, yeah, so my name's um, Luke. I'm one of the co-founders of Crowdcube. Um, so we pioneered um, equity crowdfunding, not just here in the UK, but, but globally. Um, and we're a company that's really on a mission to fuel the next generation of entrepreneurs. Those, People's, people, people that push at the edges, um, innovate, improve, um, and are constantly trying to disrupt the status quo. Um, and we're all about yeah, fueling those businesses so that they can leave their mark on the world. And, and obviously a big part of leaving a mark on the world nowadays um, revolves around sustainability, the environment, um, and generally making a, a difference to, to society. So we've seen a real surge of that, um, particularly in the last two or three years, actually. Um, so yeah, we funded well over a thousand businesses, had 1.2 million, billion, sorry, invested through the, through the platform. Um, we've got around uh, 1, 1.2 billion members as well, but around maybe 300,000 of them are active at any one time. Brilliant. I think that's probably our first port of call to dive in and uh, hit the ground running with the discussion, everyone. So I think our first point really for those listening is really to try and unpick what is sustainable and responsible investing? What does ESG mean? And why is it all of a sudden, as, as we've just touched on with Luke, becomes such a prominent part of investing and in people's thesis when they're looking to invest their capital? I don't know, Luke, if you've got any feeling for where this upwelling around ESG and 
SRI investing is coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been there's been a, there's been a broader shift and trend towards retail investment more generally. I think people are certainly looking to take control and manage their finances a bit more proactively. Um, there's obviously been a boom in fintech and access to finance and, and access to investments over the over the last five ten years, um, which has really empowered people to, as I say, take control of their investments. Um, I genuinely think that the pandemic last year, I know at the beginning of it, people were people were fearful that it might have a negative impact as people's attention was drawn to, um, to, to COVID-19 and they were worried that climate change might be a consequence of that. Actually, I think that brought into sharp focus what was really important to people. People spent a lot more time in, in nature, going out for walks, spending time with their family and friends um, and realised what was important to them and obviously you know their, their friends their family um their surroundings and their local society um was top of the list so i think that's helped to shift certainly from a retail investor's perspective um their perceptions and people want to do good with money nowadays right they want to they want to know that their investments are, are having a, a positive impact yeah, no, I think that's super prudent. I mean, I know personally speaking that, you know, the last year there's not been nothing else to do than get out into the wilderness and, and see the environment around us. And I guess, Duncan, this probably comes on to something I wanted to ask next, which is when you're looking for investments to bring on to the climate platform, how do you really vet them as to whether or not they are, you know, ESG and SRI prudent investments or are they a sheep in wolf's clothing or the other way around? Yeah, and I think I think that really goes to kind of the heart of the, of the challenge is that ESG, um, so environmental social governance, as a, as a as a tool, we we actually think is kind of flawed at climate. There are a lot of people putting money into ESG labeled fund, funds, probably not really understanding where the money is actually going. And so a lot of the ESG listed funds are actually putting money into big tech, and some of them are even putting it into fossil fuels, uh, which is which is which is rather shocking. And that. That kind of goes to this fundamental problem of, of ESG. Um, I think it started out as a, as a good um, sort of movement, but it's a negative filter. So the idea with ESG investing is that you filter uh, out companies based on the environmental, social or, or governance um, factors in, in, internally as, as companies. Um, and we don't think that's good enough because you can end up with some very strange results where you've got a fossil fuel company being in your portfolio because it does well on the social and the governance aspect, but it's a fossil fuel company. So if you're looking to make an impact on climate change or sustainability kind of more broadly, you're not really doing that with those funds which have got ESG as a sort of as a label, not necessarily. Some of them are good, some not so much. And so we took a very different approach. We take a proactive um, uh, approach, which is we, we look for companies that have a product or service that is making a difference in climate change. And that is that is very different. So we are, if you like, positively looking out for companies that have impact. And so an example might be Avestas, which is a Danish wind turbine manufacturer, which is kind of obviously doing good, having it having impact because its product, its its product is is you know helping create clean energy. And so that's a good example. Um, we have a lot of clean energy, we have a lot of clean tech businesses in our portfolio, a lot of electric mobility, sustainable food. Uh, what else are our core themes? Uh, clean water and circular economy. And I'm, I'm seeing, and I know on Crowdcube there, they're seeing quite a lot of sort of circular economy type businesses coming through, and that, that, that that's very exciting. So, and, and and clearly what you're doing, Kyle, you know, feeds into all of that. So, you know, we we think you need to be proactive. You we, you need to be looking um, for companies that are making a real difference. If you want to be having impact, truly sustainable investing is about those companies making a difference, rather than just screening out, you know, what we kind of call the nasties, you know, fossil fuels and tobacco and arms and, and other stuff. You know, we we don't think that's good enough. Um, so yeah, so that's how that's how we're doing it, at least at, at, at Climate. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Duncan. And I guess traditionally before the democratization of retail investing, a lot of people that had capital would go to funds and say, look, you know, I'm going to trust you with with my capital and to deploy that sustainably or responsibly. And I guess, Emma, this is kind of what you do day in and day out, right? It's the slightly more 
um, traditional method with an LP base that are looking to invest their capital to get a return, but also to really drive um, the SDGs as well. I'd love to hear from your perspective how you manage to reconcile those two sides of the equation, the impact, and then obviously the return on the fund as well for those LPs. It'd be great to hear your point of view on that. So I guess it's a very different dynamic depending on what fund structure you work with. So we have a, a, a tax deficient fund structure where you know it's it's sort of high net worth individuals um, investing with with a certain sort of I guess intention in mind on on the one hand, and then we have institutional funds who in in this particular case have a specific thesis they want us to achieve so on the the the, the conduit eis impact fund it's very much when you when individuals invest in the fund they 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 want us to to kind of follow the themes that we said we were going to follow i.e SD, sdg driven themes and it's not necessarily thesis focused but it's clear that we give a sort of risk a, a given risk return profile um, when 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 they invest so we very much look for depth of impact but also um, return uh, you know re return potential in, to the same extent as the as the impact so we try and sort of achieve profit and purpose in the same sort of vein which is not always the case depending on on the funds that you look at and on the institutional fund side um, it really depends on 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 the what the LPs want what the investors want but on Fair by design, it was all about tackling the poverty premium in the UK. So, so every single investment we make needs to indirectly or directly tackle some of the effects and some of the drivers of the poverty premium. And that's how we defined our investment uh, areas, our investment focus, the sort of sector verticals that we found. And the, the challenge for us was to find sector verticals that, that did not comprom compromise uh, return and impact within that thesis. And the really interesting thing we found is that with, with you know, recent tech innovations like open banking, like cloud, uh, cloud banking um, infrastructures, it, it's it actually tech allows to solve specific market failures that, that allow to solve some of those um, sort of unfair inequalities that you find across across those sectors. So we have found that through tech, you can actually um, really drive impact and return, but also following a thesis. No, that's superb. I think it's um, it's a difficult reconciliation. I think one that is becoming more and more focused as we head closer and closer to a climate collapse. I think that one thing that's very prudent to me, and it's the reason why. Oxford was founded in the first place is that we are heading off a cliff at the moment and things aren't moving fast enough and a lot of people's investment thesis I think is almost going into that protectionism and de-risking of a climate collapse coming down the funnel and I think more and more retail and professional institutional investors are now investing in things that they see to be not only prudent for the planet, but also for their own viability and whatever comes next in the world. It's a pretty catastrophizing view on, on what's happening, but I think one that we can probably all share. I'd love Duncan to hear from your point of view, you know, where you see the biggest kind of investment pools that if you were to be able to just recruit, you know, a large number of retail investors and put all their capital towards one thing, what it could potentially be. I know that Bill Gates has written a lot of uh, recent material on this, but I'd love to hear from your point of view where you'd funnel that capital. Oh, Craig, that's a really good question. So, I mean, we, like I said, we've got these six sub themes we're, we're focused on, and, and I guess clean energy is like a really obvious one, you know, and that, that is, that is, that's fairly well funded. We need to put a lot more money to work. So solar and wind, very mature technologies, is infrastructure investing now that needs a lot more i think that we need to invest three three trillion dollars a year into just the clean energy piece alone to, to hit the targets but there are some i guess slightly less less sexy sectors which actually can have a huge impact so energy efficiency um i think doesn't get as much look at as as, as kind of cooler sexier things like sustainable fashion which is getting a lot a lot of attention right now and, and, and quite rightly so but energy efficiency so you know, the homes we all live in in the UK, for example, are like Swiss cheese. They are really energy inefficient and we are burning a whole load of energy unnecessarily because we don't have simple things like insulation 
double glazing, and then and then installing things like solar and and batteries. And and the economics of those are, I, I, I would say, decent now. They're still on, on the cost curve, like solar. And so I think pouring, you know billions, trillions into energy efficiency would have a tremendous impact. Um, if you ask, ask me to pick one, I think food as well. Again, probably slightly sexier. A lot of people are moving away from, from um, kind of meat-based uh, products and dairy, uh, and that's great, into things like Oatly. You know, we've all seen Oatly um, and Beyond Meat and Impossible getting a lot of coverage, and that's helping move the consumer as well. If you get a lot of press coverage as a company, then you get, as an investment, you also get people to move as consumers, which is brilliant. Um, and, and food is a very big part of emissions as, as everyone on this panel knows. So I think, you know, I would say food and energy efficiency would be kind of two two big bets where if you just had to focus on one or two, I'd, I'd probably pick those. Brilliant, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And it's it's definitely a multimodal problem. There isn't one silver bullet and we'd probably all be funneling our capital towards it. But I think those themes are certainly some of the biggest. Um, Luke, I guess on the Crowdcube platform, you see a lot of deals, you know, very frequently. And towards the end of the pandemic, now that we're coming into the new world, lockdowns lifting, people are a lot more optimistic. Are you still seeing that drive of impact and sustainable investing continue you know are people really pushing their capital still into that funnel or are you starting to see that wane more into fintech and other things no i'm um, absolutely not that so we've uh, just leading on from from duncan there with the kind of beyond meat um um th your thesis yeah we've seen a surge in herrera which is a uh, a spanish company has raised um over four million pounds i think they've got something like five thousand investors We've got Meatless Farm, which is coming on the site next week. So there's there's a big surge there towards people recognizing and understanding that actually that their own their own behavior um, and what they consume has a has a massive impact um, on the environment. And actually, you know, investing in these companies um, becomes an extension of your own kind of morals and values and and how you can help to do to to do good. Um, yeah, clean clean energy um, has has been a, a huge um, um, sector for us um, over the years. Funding businesses like like Podpoint, which was actually acquired um, last year by by EDF, they were creating the next generation infrastructure for um, electric electric vehicles. Um, and yeah, we, we've seen a, a 32% increase um, in investors investing into green companies. I use that term quite quite broadly since since 2006 and, and 16. Um, so there's a total of kind of 70 or 80 million um, that, that's in, been invested through through the platform. Um, and we, as I said, I think COVID has brought that sh sharp focus to people about what's important to them. And um, yeah, we did a, some research recently and 10% of our investors wanted to invest in a local local business. Um, I think we've all realized that and felt the impact on our, our, you know, our local economies and our local communities. So there's a shift towards wanting to support local and almost a third were inclined to invest or more inclined to invest in um, businesses that had a positive social or environmental impact, um, which is really, really encouraging. Like at, at a very basic level, I was the judge um, for Young Enterprise, which is a... Um, uh, a, a, a regional final for lots of schools that put together um, business plans and create products and then they go out and try and sell them it's like the the, the apprentice for, for kids every single one of the finalists they all had a real sense of purpose at the heart of their business they had a real social environmental or sustainable edge to their company so um, that gave me a lot of heart that the, you know, the, the future is in safe hands if, if the next generation of entrepreneurs that are coming through schools have this front and center. I, I will say like talking, like at Crowdcube, we don't, we don't necessarily categorize and talk about businesses as ESG or their impact investing. We, have, we haven't kind of formalized or categorized that, but clearly with the likes of Duncan, there are businesses that absolutely do tick, tick all of those boxes. Um, and I think the real challenge for us in, in kind of formalizing that is for me, um, impact investing and ESGs, 
there has to be a sense of measurability about what they're doing. What is that impact they're doing? And are they measuring that impact? And, and that's, a, that's a tricky thing for us to, um, um, to, to cover at Crowdcube. And, and I think that, that is the, the, the line between where, you, where you're a business that is having an impact and has a, a, a positive purpose and where you transcend to become properly ESG or, or an impact investment is where you can actually prove and there's this demonstrable data and evidence that you are making a positive impact. Yeah, that's such a good point is that accountability and transparency. Yeah. And, you know, I think qualitative data is OK, but, you know, more and more when it comes to money and capital, the quantitative data is where it counts. And actually, that was a point I wanted to ask your opinions on, which is the kind of B Corp accreditation and the impact that that has on a company or ventures potential for raising investment. You know, it's very much the gold standard when it comes to a sustainable, responsible company. And Emma, I don't know, you know, when you're looking at a plethora of different deals to invest in and you've got one that's a B Corp and one that isn't, that looks very similar, does having that accreditation and that co company going through that process, you know, add to your decision making or is it more of a nice to have? It's almost like it, it, it helps, I guess, skip one step of due diligence, which is to sort of due diligence the, the founder intention towards um towards being sort of mission-led because we we meet a lot of founders that say they are mission-led and that the business is is uh purpose-driven but actually when you dig down in how they define their value proposition to their customers and their other uh stakeholders when it comes to talking to them about measurement and how engaged they are with potentially knowing what their sort of levers of growth and levers of impact are it it's it's a way of due diligencing just how much actually they are mission driven and and you know becoming a b corp you have to go through these steps and you have to really commit to to making those sort of key kpis really part of your commercial value proposition as well and i i mean i've i've you know in in the sort of few years i've been doing this now i i think this is the key differentiator and this is how you you actually pick the right founders is to figure out who really cares about it and will you know spend into spend on a on a great pr firm for example quite early on to to help them define that or really you know put 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 those credentials on their website or you know signals to make to actually make clear that they are mission driven yeah that's such a good insight cuz and actually from our perspective, just for our listeners, we, we're currently going through the B Corp process internally at Oxwash 2. And the work that we did with Ascension, with Emma and the team at The Conduit really helped set the bedrock for you know, the different processes, the KPIs, the impacts that need to be analyzed. But I think also it just gets like normal and good operational excellence in the business ratified, You know, getting basics right, like giving people decent maternity paternity leave, mental health support, things that actually make your business operation more sustainable. There's no point having a mission-led business if the way that the business is run is absolutely catastrophic with a high churn rate and everyone hates working for them. So I think we found B Corp is actually a really good instruction book on just how to be a good manager, how to be a good C-suite and construct the culture of the company so that you can all align on that mission. And it's really interesting that that's exactly what you've said from the other side. I mean, Duncan, when, when you're looking at investments through Climate, is accreditation from B Corp or other platforms kind of part of the scoring process that you go through or part of any kind of internal process when a company is listing? I mean, we, I mean, we, we look at that and we look at a whole, a whole bunch of other data and we think, we, we think the B Corp um, accreditation is, is a nice to have. We don't think it's a must. I mean, I think we, we, we go really, really deep in the companies we're looking at. So you know what is again what is what is the product they're selling is kind of the primary filter what is a the product they're selling is it having a positive impact on on climate change and if you get through that filter then we have a much more if you like sophisticated which is using a whole load of data feeds so we have data feeds from various third parties we build our own data we do look at things like b corp and and, and similar and and all that sort of stuff you know goes into the pot if you like and helps us um you know, pick the pick the best ones from that kind of top top funnel, if you like, 
top of fund from companies which which have got a good product or service so so yes it is and we ourselves we haven't been through the bcop uh process ourselves yet it's it's in our pipeline it's definitely something we'd like to do i mean i think you know our core mission and everybody who joins our business with 30 people now everybody has joined because they want to be part of you know what they think is a mission that can have a really get, but good impact and and it's worth mentioning that um, an interesting data point, there's some research done a couple of years ago that actually where you put your money actually has a bigger impact than all the other behavioral changes like eating less meat, cycling more, flying less, taking public transport, all those things which we should be doing and should be nudged to doing um, by different means, but actually impact investing or putting your money into companies making a difference, your pension in particular, can have a tremendous impact uh, on carbon. So that's you know really at the heart of, of what we're doing. So you're saying uh, we should all put our money where our mouth is, both That's figuratively. It's funny, it's funny. It's some, it's some, it's some, uh, we, we've sort of had that sentence a few times. Another one is put you put your money where your morals are, uh, which is, is even sort of straight to, to, to the point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, that's very prudent and something we can all live by. I mean, a lot of the times we're not in control of where our money's going, especially with employer pensions and things like that. It's difficult to even know, you know, where our nest pension scheme that, you know, we, we have at Oxwash, where that money really lives and where it actually makes a difference, which is, I guess, one of the downsides around the ESG and SRI investing, which is the other side of the coin. You know, how do you know when you're investing in a company that's going to those good impacts? I guess, Luke, a question for you is what are those downsides to people wanting to invest in sustainable ventures and responsible businesses and how can we perhaps tackle those in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess that the, the risk of greenwashing, which is you know, a tag that's sort of thrown around. I mean, I, I certainly feel like some of the big ESG funds that have just gone through a rebranding process and, and not really changed a whole great deal but now call themselves an ESG fund. Yeah, there's a risk that, yeah, people can be duped into think, feeling like their money is doing, doing good when it's, when, it's, when it's not. I mean, and there's a perception that maybe you're compromising um, um, potential returns um, for backing good, you know, good causes and good businesses. And, and you know, that absolutely isn't the case. There's lots and lots of data out there to show that businesses, you know, with a real sense of, um, purpose that are focusing on the people and planet um, as well as profit um, are better businesses you know there's, there's there's a huge amount of data out there um, I, I guess I guess part of the risk may be that you know, some of this some of the businesses that you may be investing in is their nascent industries the technology is underdeveloped so there's there's a bit of a gamble there on you know the businesses and the industries that you're investing in we, will they be the ones that go on to become Kind of um, um, mainstream, um, so but um, yeah, I, I, yeah, you, for me, you're, you're investing in in the future though. Yeah, the future has to be sustainable. It has to be focusing on the environment. Um, we have to be safeguarding our society. So um, yeah, and, and you, you you just simply cannot be investing in you know, British American tobacco and things like that, which are dead, dead industries. One, one question I'm, I'm really curious about, I'm a, I'm a massive, massive fan of um, B Corp, the B Corp music movement, and there are lots of businesses that are funded on Crowdcube, Finister, Mindful Chef, um, Vivo Barefoot, Brewdog, <coughs> Simple Feast, and, and the, the like have been um, B Corps. And... I, I sort of feel like maybe there's a, there's a there's room for the government to do more to incentivize people. When maybe it's B Corp or maybe there's some other um, um, kind of test or criteria that they need to meet where there there maybe are tax breaks. Maybe you do get a cor a corporation ta tax break, or maybe there are other incentives for businesses that do go through that process. And I'm really curious. To hear, sorry, I feel like I'm taking over a bit here, Carl. But I'm really Please, interested yeah. in <laughs> your point. views and 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 Duncan um, and Emma as well. Whether they think those sorts of government incentives, top down, to try and accelerate this shift from businesses to becoming more more mindful of the planet. I like yeah. that. Yeah, let's get let's get a movement going. I I think that's a seriously good idea. As long as you, as long as you know, you can, you know, you can trust these sort of third-party accreditation, whether it's B Corp or, or, or something else. See that, you know, need, 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 would need it. You know, government need to have a really good look at that. But absolutely, you know, money, money makes people 
change their behaviors, right? And you know, we've obviously seen with EIS investing through platforms like Crowdcube, uh, that can really help um, move money in, in the right direction to do you know good things. So yeah, I'd be behind that. I can I'll sign off on that. <laughs> Amen. I think there's those kind of pipelines already exist, right? Whereas a tech company, you can get enormous R and D tax credits back for just proving that you know you are spending on innovation. And I think that there's there's no innovate UK like things like innovate UK are sort of tending towards that direction. But yeah. mm. I think it's a great point if you can prove that what you're spending your money on in your business is mission led and having an impact then yeah of course why not get a third of your costs back from where you've spent that money i mean that system exists we claim on it every year i think it's a great idea i know there's a, there's a social investment tax relief for not-for-profit entities actually in place it's sort of like a an eis scheme for for charities yeah. but i do think maybe there should be a sort of a slightly different EIS SEIS scheme for mission led companies. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Next stop, number 10 for me. <laughs> I, I, I think one of the points you just made, um, Luke, which is really important to note for listeners, is that, yeah, investing in sustainable and responsible businesses is not a cut on your return. I mean, looking at some data before this call, BlackRock did an awesome survey on kind of all funds last year and how they all performed and ranked them on sustainability impact focus and 88% of them of the sustainable funds outperformed their non-sustainable counterparts. So obviously it's not only a prudent moral investment, but also financial as well. If you are driven by that internal currency compass, actually, you know, it is a good place to put your money if you want to maximize your returns as well. But maybe Duncan, just on that point, I'd love to hear your thoughts around what are the biggest barriers for you recruiting people to invest sustainably on your platform and, and what kind of communication, what education pieces you're working on there to maximize that? Yeah, I, I, I would say the barriers are, are really just getting the message out that we exist and, and I guess similar platforms that are you know trying to have an impact. Um, I think there is a, been absolutely massive groundswell towards people who want to have an impact with the money. Um, but they are people who want to have a return as well. So, you know, as, as Luke sort of just touched on, you've got to be giving a return as well, but this is not charity. And, and the data does tend to suggest that you can have a, a, a market beating return if you're putting your money into companies that are making uh, an impact. And it's kind of obvious if you think about it. So the, these are the companies of the future. And if you're, if you're using them as a consumer, if you're moving to sort of plant-based meat and, you, and you're cycling more, so the companies that are doing the right thing, uh, which we're using as consumers more and more, and getting loads and loads of coverage in the press, it's pretty obvious that if you put your money to them also as, a, as an investor, you're probably going to do pretty well. And the data does, does bear that out in the last five to 10 years that you, ha you have had a market beating return in places like clean energy and clean tech. In particular, last year, clean energy went through the roof. Um, questions about sort of valuations possibly, and they've come off a little bit um, Q1 of this year, but the returns have been very good. And uh, I think because we need systemic change, you know, putting on my sort of uh, uh, sermonizing hat for a second, like we need systemic change around the world. We need to change a lot of behavior, how we live, how, how different industries work. And, and that requires huge amounts of capital. But if you're putting money into those industries, it seems pretty obvious that you're likely over the long term, there'll be some blips on the, along the way that you're going to do pretty well as an investor as well. So, um, you know, getting that message out, that this is not charity is probably the biggest challenge. I would say that sort of green stuff, historically, you know, recycling has always been seen as a bit mucky and do I really want to do that? Where do I put my plastic thing? And I really having an impact. Actually, sustainable investing has a very direct impact and, and getting that message out, I think, is probably the biggest challenge that this is not charity. This can actually give you a very good return and have an impact. I, and I, I, just to add to that, Duncan, I, I'm really bullish on this, I think. Millennials and, and Gen, Gen Zers have been the driving force behind this kind of era that we're, we're in at the moment of conscious consumerism, where, where they are voting with their feet and buying products that they really believe in and match their morals. And I think similarly, you're seeing this kind of conscious investor um, um, trend emerge. And 95% and of millennials, I, I read um, the other day, are interested in impact investing. And, and something like by 2030, millennials will hold five times as much wealth, wealth as they do today because they're going to inherit 
yeah. something like 68 trillion from the, the baby boomers over the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So that, there's a great wealth transfer that's going to exist and it's going to land in the hands of people that I think hopefully have got a much stronger moral compass yeah. um, and will be seeking out you know, um, investment opportunities that, that have a, you know, a, 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 a sustainability and environmental or so, social edge to them. But the one the one thing I would add is also, you know, impact investing is also just investing and people need to understand there's a very like there's various d d different degrees of returns depending on what asset class you go into. So, you know, there's a lot of really interesting asset backed infrastructure funds that look into into clean, clean energy that are, you know, the return will be vastly different to to a venture fund, um, but it and it will it will it will follow. Um, you know, it will follow a, maybe a non-impact um, return for this particular asset class. So I think, you know, there just needs to be an education on what's out there, what people want to do with, you know, what, what people want to do with their assets, whether they want it liquid, non-liquid, because, you know, from a, in, in the, venture, the venture world, I think it's just starting actually to democratize impact or non-impact, you know, it's, it's just starting to kind of open up, I think, to, to people and they're starting to understand what it means, you know, tying up your money for five, six years. Um, but I'd, I'd, and, and on that, you know, lo lots, of, lots of founders now are coming on being, being mission driven. So I, I do think, you know, that the sort of dem democratization of venture, the sort of, the, the, the um, I guess the development of other asset classes over and above just you know your 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 ICES, I, I, that's also I think going to go in the favor of impact investing because you're you're then going to start to understand the different return profiles of your money and what you want to do with it and the the, the sort of technology advances that are coming on. I think I, the founders that are coming on are all mission led. Like there's all the all the sort of tailwinds are pointing towards very various different levels of impact investing, from social impact investing to environmental impact investing in the same way. No, that's super prudent. Thanks, Sarah. And I think Luke, Luke, your point as well around trying to get younger generations investing early. You know, I remember growing up when we first moved to the UK from South Africa. My mum was like here's a card, put money on it, save it. You can't access it until you're 21. And it was a really good education in just saving your money. But what if we can build a structure like that for our young generations where they can actually take a portion of their pocket money and put it in places that they really believe in? I think that would be an awesome little spin-off of, uh, of Crowdcube or Climate maybe in the future to really activate that next generation. Because like you said, they'll inherit it, but they probably have some capital lying around now to get a taste for, for the investing. I don't know if you think that's a good idea or batshit X. <laughs> I think you're up against it trying to get a kid to part with his pocket money. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, I love the sentiment behind it. Maybe yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why not? Exactly. I think, I think there's something in getting, making sure people have um, pensions early on and, and I know in the UK we've got auto enrollment pensions um, which has had a, a massive impact making sure that people um, are saving for the future and are putting money aside and, and I think maybe there's a more systematic way that you can make sure that, that the money that is being invested in those pensions is easier for it to be invested in um, yeah, businesses with with a with a with a real sense of purpose and an ethical compass. Because I think maybe that would be an easier way to um, to to you know unlock and you know, huge amounts of capital going into the right types of business, rather than um, yeah getting kids pocket money. That would be a bit tricky. <laughs> no, that's a fair point. I think maybe my last question to each of you um, to wrap things up is: what one tip would you give to somebody in the coffee queue that overhears your conversation talking about sustainable investing and goes, oh, I want, I want in too. What would be the, the one tip that you'd give them around putting their first, first investment into a, into a sustainable fund or venture? Maybe Emma, you could start. Well, I guess, you know, two things that it goes back to what I was saying earlier, understand your risk, your own risk return profile, impact or non-impact. What type of investor are you anyway at this point in time? And then pick, Un pick the themes you're interested in 
uh, and research based on those on those themes, not just generic impact investing, sustainable investing. Like look at what your look at the themes underneath that that you're interested in, and you'll you'll find a lot more um, sort of enriched data and information and platforms to to uh, to do that by. So get granular, I guess, is your advice. Find a pattern. Yeah. Nice. No, I think that's very prudent. Duncan, do you have any tips for our listeners on other other than obviously downloading climate immediately? <laughs> I mean, that is, that is kind of the, ob the obvious answer. I mean, I think sort of going you know, what Emma just said, I mean, there are some people who will want to dig deep and want to spend a lot of time and get granular. And there are other people who just want a pre-made, pre-curated solution. And that's kind of what we provide, which is three portfolios, depending on your risk profile. We're only putting your money into companies having an impact. And if, if you want to make an impact, then then our product or, or perhaps somebody else's, um, you know, it's, it's ready, ready, it's oven cooked and you can have an impact in within sort of 10 minutes because the onboarding process is, is relatively straightforward. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I would suggest. Awesome. Thank you very much, Duncan. And maybe Luke, you can round us off with some hints and tricks you've discovered over the years. I, I think, I think, I think Emma hit the, yeah, the nose on the head or the button on the head or whatever the same might be is, is, you know, find something that you're really passionate about, find something you really believe in. Um, I think that's, that's a really important aspect of investing, particularly this type of investing where you're looking to have an impact. Um, and then, and then just, just make sure you do your due diligence, that you understand you know, why you're investing, you understand your, your risk appetite. Um, and yeah, yeah, invest, you know, invest aware. Um, I think I think Duncan's platform climate is a brilliant place to to start, as is as is Crowdcube. Brilliant! Thank you all so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I think some real nuggets for people to digest and hopefully dig out that pocket money wherever it is and start putting it to good use rather than sitting under the couch. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. Really appreciate it, and have a great rest of your weeks. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.